All right, here on the Rich Van Tassel channel, breaking down Week 11 Sunday games. Uh, getting right into it, starting with the Oakland Raiders and the Detroit Lions. Detroit won this game 18-13. to Oakland drops the 4-6. and Detroit improves the 3-7. and The box score for the visiting um, Raiders, Derek Carr looks like his worst game of the day, or of the year, that is. 13-25, of 169 yards. No touchdowns, no interceptions. Latavius Murray, you could say the same thing about him running the ball. 13 carries, 28 yards. Uh, overall, 21 for 50. 2.4 yards per carry. The one touchdown was Latavius Murray's. Seth Roberts was the top receiver. Two receptions, 54 yards. Michael Crabtree, 6 for 50. Amari Cooper, 1 for 4. Crabtree fumbled once, was not lost. Marquette King and Derek Carr also fumbled. None of them were lost. Four sacks, no interceptions, so no takeaways because they didn't recover any fumbles. Nothing of note in the return games. For the Lions, Matthew Stafford, 22 of 35, 282 yards. No touchdowns, more importantly, no interceptions. He's had his turnover issues this year. Amir Abdullah running the ball, 12 for 44. Matthew Stafford, 6 for 31. He ran for a touchdown. Overall, 31 for 109. Three and a half yards per carry and the Stafford touchdown running the ball. Calvin Johnson, again, putting up uh, serviceable numbers, numbers you would take for a lot of other guys, but not for Calvin Johnson. Five receptions, 88 yards. Golden Tate, 8 for 73. Theo Riddick, 5 for 72. No fumbles, recovered or lost. One sack, no interceptions, so a, real, a turnover-free game by both teams. Amir Abdullah in the kick return had two for 54, so that's 27 yards per, car per return. Golden Tate had one for 26, so they did a good job of returning the ball yesterday. And Matt Prater made three field goals. So, Oakland drops to four and six. They picked a heck of a time to have their worst game. As we told you, Derek Carr, Latavius Murray, and Amari Cooper all looks like their worst game of the season. A game they had to have. I mean, Detroit is improving. They're now off two straight wins. They did beat Green Bay last week, so they're showing uh, some character late in the year. Oakland, however, a team that wants to make the playoffs has got to win these games. Now, they're really not out of it because, as we've discussed, Hovering around 500 will keep you in it in the AFC wildcard picture. But they've got some work to do, and certainly they can't uh, let many more games like this go. So we'll see how, um, what happens with them in the future. But give the Lions credit. Uh, they're playing well down the stretch. They have Philadelphia on Thanksgiving, so we'll see what they can do. If uh, they can continue to roll and move in the right direction. They had a good season last year, and this season has certainly gotten away from them. Next up, the Cowboys defeated the Dolphins 24-14. Cowboys ending their seven-game skid. Moved to 3-7. and seven. Miami is 4-6. and six. For the visiting Cowboys, Tony Romo in his return. 18-28, of 28, two touchdowns, two interceptions. Darren McFadden ran the ball very well, 29-129. of 129. Robert Turbin recently added 7 for 35. Altogether 38 for 166, which is 4.4 yards per carry. Terrence Williams, 4 for 79 and a touchdown. Des Bryant, 4 for 45 and a touchdown. No fumbles. They did have three sacks. Rolando McLean had an interception return for a touchdown. Nothing of note in the return game. Ryan Tannehill, 13 of 24, 188 yards, two touchdowns, one interception. Lamar Miller, 7 for 44, 6.3 yards per carry. Ryan Tannehill, 3 for 13, 4.3 yards per carry. Overall, 14 for 70, which is 5 yards per carry, so you wonder why they didn't run the ball more. Jarvis Landry, 4 for 66 in the receiving game. Kenny Stills, 2 for 52, and a touchdown. Mike Pouncey fumbled. It was not lost. Two sacks, two interceptions were Brent Grimes and Neville Hewitt for the Dolphins. Uh, Jarvis Landry returning the ball, two returns for 33 yards. So that's 16 yards per return. Nothing really spectacular there. All right, so the Cowboys uh, with Tony Romo uh, got the win, so they're uh, hoping they can get rolling now. Uh, Romo obviously was a bit rusty, as we said, but he just showed, um, you know, basically that the offense can be opened up more with him. Now, a lot of that is on Scott Lenahan, the offensive coordinator, for not, you know, opening it up with the other guys. I felt he could have done so, and I think that's what really held him back, but... It's in the past now, so Tony Romo comes in, and you could see that the offense was just a lot more proficient, as you would expect with Tony Romo. Ryan Tannehill, I don't think he is the quarterback uh, of the future. I've never really fought much of Ryan Tannehill. I think a lot of people, um, they wanted to you know stretch for this guy because 
Uh, they couldn't get Andrew Luck that year when they wanted a quarterback. Uh, a lot of people talk about his confidence, you know, but he's just not playing well enough. You can be as confident as you want. So are used car salesmen that don't make them good people. Um, that's what it is, though. Miami now drops the 4-6 and six again, still in the wild card because they are hovering right around that 500 mark. But, you know, this was a game you would expect a, a team like a Miami who's one, a Miami team that would want to go places would win. Uh, they didn't. So Dallas plays Carolina on Thanksgiving. They're going to look to end the undefeated season. Miami, where do they go from here? Okay, next up, Denver in Brock Osweiler's first career start beat the Chicago Bears 17-15. to Brock Osweiler, 20 of 27, 250 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Ronnie Hillman running the ball, 21-102, 4.9 yards per carry. C.J. Anderson, 12 for 59, also 4.9 yards per carry. Altogether, 36 for 170, 4.7 yards per carry, so they ran the ball very well. Owen Daniels was the top receiver, 4 for 69. Vernon Davis, 6 for 68. Demarius Thomas, 3 for 59 with a touchdown. And Cody Lattimore, 2 for 22 and a touchdown. Malik Jackson recovered a fumble. They had only two sacks. Danny Trevathan had an interception. Omar Bolden in the return game, 3 for 45, so that's only 15 uh, yards per return. For the Bears, Jay Culler, 18 of 32, 265. No touchdowns, one interception. Kadeem Carey running the ball, 9 for 32, 3.6 yards per carry. Jay Cutler, again, he runs the ball pretty well, 3 for 29, 9.7 yards per carry. And Jeremy Langford, 13 for 25, and a touchdown. All the other 25 for 86, 3.4 yards per carry, and the one touchdown. Marquez Wilson, the top receiver, 4 for 102. Joshua Bellamy, 4 for 57. Zach Miller, 3 for 47. Jay Cutler lost the fumble, so he turned the ball over twice. He uh, had probably his worst game in a while yesterday. They gave up five sacks, so he was also sacked five times. Uh, Deontay Thompson, two returns for 54 yards, so that's 27 yards per return. Good in the return game. So, Denver, uh, a lot of talk is going to be about who's going to be the starter, Brock Osweiler or Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning has not played well enough uh, to earn or to definitely keep his job. The only thing Peyton Manning can bank on is his name being Peyton Manning. If it was anyone else, Brock Osweiler would, would clearly be getting the start. Well, not anyone else, but, you know, anyone not a Tom Brady, a Drew Brees, uh, you know, an Eli Manning, a Ben Roethlisberger, a Tony Romo, any of those guys would certainly not be uh, ready to come back. Uh, for the Bears, at 4-6, and six, now the wild card doesn't seem as uh, unobtainable as it was early on, you know, about five weeks ago when Atlanta was really playing well. They're going to have to, you know, just right the ship now. Jay Cutler's going to have to get back to not turning the ball over, and if he can do so, they got a shot. But, uh, you know, he can have bad games, but he'll have to turn around from now. I'd like to see them still run the ball a bit better and take the ball out of his hands. But we'll see what they do from this point forward. Certainly not out of it, but Jay Cutler had a bad game. Got to put it behind him. Next up, the Indianapolis Colts beat the Atlanta Falcons 24-21. to Indianapolis is now 5-5. Five and five. Atlanta, that sound you're hearing is them crashing back to earth as they drop to 6-4. and four. They're 1-4 in their last five games. Matt Hasselbeck got the start for Andrew Luck. 23 for 32, 213 yards, two touchdowns, two interceptions. Frank Gore, 14 for 34, 2.4 yards per carry. Amon Bradshaw, 9 for 32. It's 3.6 yards per carry. Altogether, 27 of 74, 2.7 yards per carry. Frank Gore was the top receiver, 5 for 46. Colby Fleener, 3 for 45. Dante Moncrie, 5 for 41. Ahmad Bradshaw was 4 for 20. He had both of the touchdowns. Frank Gore lost a fumble. Tequil Jackson recovered a fumble. Only one sack. They had three interceptions of Matt Ryan. One of them by Tequil Jackson was returned for touchdown. Quan Bray in the kick return was two uh, returns for 70 yards. That's 35 yards per return. Very good there. For the Falcons, Matt Ryan, 25 of 46, 280, yo or, yeah, 280 yards, three touchdowns, but three interceptions. Tevin Coleman, 17 for 48. Uh, that's 2.8 yards per carry. Devontae Freeman, 3 for 43, 14.3. I believe uh, Devontae Freeman was hurt in this game. Matt Ryan, 2 for 7. Overall, 24 for 100, 4.2 yards per return. Julio Jones, big day, 9 for 160. Leonard Hankerson, 4 for 36 and a touchdown. Tevin Coleman lost a fumble. Paul Warlow recovered a fumble. 
They only had two sacks. Ricardo Allen and Paul Warlow had the interceptions. Eric Williams, a 26-yard kick return. So, Indianapolis now tied still atop that division at 5-5. Five and five. We'll see if a win like this can propel them forward. They are at the 500 mark. They do have six games to play. They can certainly uh, still achieve everything they wanted to coming into this year. A lot of it's going to depend on Andrew Luck's health. Uh, you saw how limited this offense was with Frank Gore being the top receiver. He also didn't run the ball uh, particularly well because they were... Uh, Atlanta was most likely stacking the line of scrimmage, not really worrying about Matt Hasselbeck. Things would open up in the running game with an Andrew Luck at quarterback. As for Atlanta, we just discussed they are 1-4 and four in their last five games, playing more like the team I expected early in the year. Uh, if Devontae Freeman's out, we'll see how much that affects their offense because Matt Ryan is turning the ball over a lot now. He's trying to get the ball downfield to Julio Jones. Who is having good games, but if it's going to cost you three turnovers to do so, or three interceptions to do so, then you're going to have a problem. So Atlanta, you got to, they've really let a lot of teams back into it with their recent struggles. They've certainly fallen far from contending for that NFC South. They're now four games back with six to play. That's about as certainly unobtainable as you can get. If they can right the ship, they still control their own destiny for a playoff spot in the wild card, but. They're showing nothing of late that would uh, lead you to believe that they can do so. So we'll see what happens with them the rest of the way. All right. The Jets went to Houston and lost. It was 24-17 Texans. Both teams are now 5-5. Five and five. Jets trending downward. Houston obviously trending upward. For the Jets, Ryan Fitzpatrick, 19-39. 216 yards, one touchdown, two interceptions. Chris Ivory, 8 for 36, 4.4.5 yards per carry. Bilal Powell, 4 for 22, 5.5 yards per carry. Overall, 21 for 70, which is 3.3 yards per carry, which include Ryan Fitzpatrick, uh, 5 for 12, and Stephen Ridley, 4 times for 0 yards. So if they kept it in Ivory and, pa and Powell's hands, which they should have done more, their running numbers would be better. Eric Decker, 4 for 81. Blaw Powell, 5 for 67. Brandon Marshall, 5 for 47 in a touchdown in the receiving game. Uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick fumbled and was not lost, and Marcus Williams recovered a fumble. Only one sack, so they were not able to get pressure on the young TJ Yates. No interceptions. Antonio Cromartie, 4 returns for 97 yards. That's 24.3 yards per return. That's uh, pretty good. Jeremy Curley, 5 for 39. 7.8 yards per punt return, so that's not bad either. For the Texans, TJ Yates was not spectacular either. 16 of 34, 229 yards, two touchdowns. He did not turn the ball over. Cecil Shorts threw a pass. It was completed for 21 yards and a touchdown. Alfred Blue, 21 of 58, 2.8 yards per rush. Jonathan Grimes, 6 for 37. Cecil Shorts, the third, 4 for 26. Overall, 37 for 123, 3.3 yards per carry, which isn't great in the running game. But they stuck with it with the uh, inexperienced quarterback. DeAndre Hopkins continues to impress this year. He was beating Darrell Rivas a lot yesterday. 5 for 118, 2 touchdowns. Cecil, Cecil Shorts, the third, 2 for 51. Alfred Blue, 3 for 34, and the touchdown. TJ Yates lost the fumble. So that was his turnover. Keith Mumphrey fumbled, but it was not lost. They had three sacks. And. It did not, or two of them belong to J.J. Watt, so you would expect that. The two interceptions. Nothing really of note in the return game. So, Houston, we'll start with them first. Their defense is starting to come along, a defense I expected a lot more out of. At the beginning of the year, they're really starting to play well. They're certainly becoming dangerous. Now, obviously, Brian Hoyer, who I'm not too sold on, but is still a better option than T.J. Yates. They're going to look to get him back as soon as they can to move forward because with T.J. Yates, I don't think he has enough experience to take this team that far, though they are in that weak division. But I think Indianapolis is going to get it uh, together at some point. The Jets are now 5-5. Five and five. Now, we said this weeks ago that the Jets should have taken the wins they got from Ryan Fitzpatrick and been happy and gone back to Geno Smith. Now, people can say hindsight is 2020. In this case, the, hind the foresight was 2020 because Ryan Fitzpatrick is starting to show the quarterback he is. He turns the ball over, throws a lot of incompletions. Uh, he had the two interceptions. His fumble was not lost, but he still shows the uh, tendency to turn the ball over. So that's where the Jets are now. Obviously, neither one of these teams is out of it in the wild card. Houston is very much alive in their division. The Jets, though... 
it might be too late to start Geno Smith, so I would expect if Ryan Fitzpatrick keeps going, this team is going to flounder and you know, could be looking at a seven and nine, six and ten finish or, you know, something awful like that. I would go to Geno Smith if I'm the Jets. They will not I don't shouldn't say will not with any certainty. It is almost certain they will not do it at this point in the year. But that's where it stands from here. So both teams five and five, but both teams going in different directions. Next up, Tampa Bay rocked the Philadelphia Eagles forty five to seventeen yesterday in Philadelphia. For the visiting Buccaneers, Jameis Winston, 19 of 29, 246 yards, 5 touchdowns, no interceptions. Doug Martin, 27 for 235, 8.7 yards per rush, very good. Charles Sims, 10 for 43, altogether 42 for 283, which is 6.7 yards per rush. That included 4 carries by Jameis Winston for 0 yards. I don't know if those were kneel downs or how that went exactly. But uh, you have four for zero. That's going to take the numbers down a bit. And the numbers are very impressive, even with that. Mike Evans, four for 63 and a touchdown. Vincent Jackson, four for 56 and a touchdown. Cameron Bray, three for 47. Charles Sims, three for 26. And Russell Shepard, one for four with the other touchdowns. Jacques Smith uh, fumbled and was lost, but he also recovered it. Or had a fumble recovery. I don't know exactly how that works. Bobby, oh, he recovered either Bobby Rainey or Jameis Winston's fumbles. Either of those were lost. Three sacks, uh, three interceptions, Bobby Rainey, uh, one return of 20 yards. Nothing else really of note. For the Eagles, Mark Sanchez, 26 of 41, 261 yards, two touchdowns, three interceptions. DeMarco Murray, 13 of 64. 4.9 yards per rush. Ken John Barber, 7 for 37, 5.3. Overall, 28 for 136, 4.9 yards per rush. Brent Selick, 7 of 79 in the return game, or in the receiving game. Riley Cooper, 2 for 42. Josh Huff, 1 for 39. Darren Spoles, 3 for 38. The latter two had the touchdowns. DeMarco Murray lost a fumble. Brent Selick recovered a fumble. They had one sack, no interceptions. Josh Huff, four returns for 96 yards, so good in the return game. Darren Sproles was held in check in the full return game. Tampa Bay is quietly moving up to 5-5. Five and five. They've really been playing well of late. I believe they're on a three-game win streak, could even be four. Uh, they're certainly in the wild card picture with Atlanta coming back to earth. So now a very uh, muddled picture in the, AFC, or in the NFC wild card. Uh, you'd have to put Philadelphia in that as well, though they're still looking at the division. A drop to 4-6. and six. James Winston, uh, he's starting to not turn the ball over, so he responded very well from the game last week against Dallas where he was turning it over. Mark Sanchez, that's what he does. Now, I'll give Mark Sanchez a bit of a break. He is getting his first start of the season, so you'd have to expect he's going to have a, a couple problems uh, with turnover still, though. This is what he's done his entire career. I think, though, with more playing time, it would uh, decrease those number of turnovers. We'll have to see, though, how long Sam Bradford is out for. Uh, DeMarco Murray was running the ball better, but he didn't get that many carries. That's not what is really going to happen in the Chip Kelly offense, though. He's going to distribute uh, the carries throughout a variety of backs, as he did yesterday. Philly is a game back of the, of the uh, Giants, who were on a bye week yesterday. So they're still looking at that division, but they have got to start playing with some consistency. Tampa Bay is going to keep rolling. Obviously, the division is their five back with six games left, so they really have no shot at all of winning that division. If Atlanta had very little shot, Tampa Bay has no shot. But they will look to continue to make some noise in the wild card, so we'll see where they go from here. Next up, the St. Louis Rams went to Baltimore and lost 16-13. to The Rams obviously still with the Jekyll and Hyde Act. Uh, they did not get much from their quarterback and replacing Nick Foles, Case Keenum, 12-26, 136, one touchdown, no interceptions. Ty Gurley held in check, 25 of 66, and that's 2.6 yards per rush and a touchdown. All together, 29 of 82, which is 2.8. Uh, Lance Kendricks, 2 for 43 and a touchdown receiving. Jared Cook, 4 for 31. Case Keenum fumbled three times and lost two of them. Tavon Austin fumbled and was lost, as well as Ty Gurley. So they had four fumbles. Those were the four turnovers they had. Only one sack. Nothing really of note in the return games. 
for the Ravens. Joe Flacco put it up a bunch yesterday. They don't have to worry about his arm anymore because he uh, tore his ACL, so he's done for the season. He was throwing a lot this year, 27-44, 299, one touchdown, two interceptions. Travoris Allen, 22 of 67. Justin Forsett, 4 of 26. That's 3 yards and 6.5 and yards per carry um, in the running game between the two. Crockett Gilmore, 5 for 101. Kamir Aiken, 5 for 50. Javoris Allen, 5 for 48 in the receiving game. Kamir Aiken had the touchdown. Jeremy Butler and Max Williams both fumbled. They were not lost. And Albert McClellan, Lawrence Guy, Courtney Upshaw, and C.J. Mosley all uh, recovered the fumbles of St. Louis. Only one sack, no interceptions. Robert Moster, two uh, returns for 58 yards. That's almost 30 yards per return, 29 exactly. Justin Tucker missed uh, two field goals. You don't expect that from Justin Tucker a lot. So St. Louis, uh, as we discussed, Atlanta's keeping teams like St. Louis in the wild card picture, but they've been way too up and down in Jekyll and Hyde this year. Um, you'd have to wonder what they're going to do with quarterback. They don't have any answers there, and that's reflected in their play. That's why they've been so inconsistent, because the quarterback play has just been wretched for them. Baltimore now 3-7. and seven. Uh, Outside shot at the wild card, I guess, but they would really have to you know, look to run the table or at least get to 8-8 eight and eight to have any realistic shot. And I wouldn't expect that now that Joe Flacco is out. So we'll see what each team does from here. We'll see how Baltimore uh, plays it the rest of the year with their backup in and where St. Louis goes with their starting quarterback, who do they turn to now. The Redskins got threshed on the road in Carolina, 44-16. Washington drops to 4-6 and six and own 5 on the road. Carolina is now 10-0. Kirk Cousins did have a good game, 27 of 30, 22 of 30, 207 yards, one touchdown, one interception. They were not able to run the ball at all, though. Chris Thompson, 4 for 10. Kirk Cousins, 1 for 4, overall 12 for 14. Now they did uh, start getting blown out in this game, so that's where it, uh, the running uh, game started to diminish. Obviously, you're going to have to throw a lot more. Uh, we had a bad call early in this game when it was still tied. I think that really affected Washington when it was 14-14. to A hit on a receiver, I believe it was Greg Olson, uh, allowed the ball to be popped up and intercepted in return for a touchdown. They called a personal foul on it for hitting a defenseless receiver. I thought it was a terrible call. And as we see terrible calls, you wouldn't think in a 44-16 game, well, what does that call matter? It was 14-14 at the time. So... Uh, again, these bad calls can really affect teams, but you know, that's the NFL today. So who knows what you can say about it? Uh, getting back to the box score five for 87 in the receiving game for Deshaun Jackson. He had a touchdown Jordan Reed six for 46 Kirk cousins lost two fumbles. So he had the three turnover day. Jordan Reed lost his fumble. Matt Jones lost his fumble. So overall they had six turnovers or excuse me, five turnovers, just not good enough. Only two sacks. Andre Roberts, four for 177, which is 44.3 yards per return. He did have a 99 yard for a touchdown. So you take that out, his numbers are starting to look a bit more pedestrian. Um, but still pretty good as far as average-wise. But again, you don't want to be returning the ball that many times because it means the other team is scoring on you. Kim Newton, 21 of 34, 246 yards, five touchdowns, no interceptions. That would be the game that really puts him right up there at the top of the list in MVP consideration. Jonathan Stewart, 21 of 102, 4.9 yards per rush. Cam Newton, 4 for 16, overall 39 of 142, 3.6 yards per rush. Devin Funches got his first start. The rookie, 4 receptions, 64 yards, 16 yards per reception, and a touchdown. Jericho Cotri, 4 for 57. Greg Olson, Tegan Jr., uh, Jonathan Stewart and Mike Tolbert all had touchdowns. Derek Anderson came in and fumbled, was not lost. Thomas Davis, Luke Keekley, Coney Ely, and Benny Bernwicki had the re uh, the recoveries of the Washington fumbles. They had five sacks. Kurt Coleman had an interception. And nothing of note in the return game. So, Washington has the Giants uh, at home, I believe, next week. So, we'll see if they can get it together uh, at a with a home victory. Obviously, we were discussing Washington as a Jekyll and Hyde. 
their situation is really just the play. I mean, Kirk Cousins' play is part of it, but it's he's a different guy at home as he is on the road. Carolina is going to play Dallas on Thanksgiving, and they're going to look to move to 11-0. How long can they keep this rolling? We will see. But uh, certainly they are almost uh, certainly going to get home field advantage in the NFC because they've beaten Green Bay already. That division is theirs. It's all but locked up. All oh, just a formality now. So we'll see if uh, they continue to keep their foot on the gas pedal if they have a let up here in these next couple weeks. Kansas City beat San Diego 33 to 3. Kansas City has now quietly won four straight games. They are five and five and right there in the wild card. San Diego, a bad year for them. They are now two and eight. Alex Smith quietly putting together a very efficient season, 20 of 25, 253 yards, no touchdowns, no interceptions. Spencer Ware running the ball, 11 for 97, 8.7 yards per rush, two touchdowns. Alex Smith, 7 for 33, 4.7 yards per rush. Trey Kendrick West, 11 for 16. Overall, 31 of 153, that's 4.9 yards per rush and the three touchdowns. Albert Wilson, 4 for 56, running them or receiving. Chen Chark Hendrick West, 2 for 48. Travis Kelsey, 5 for 46. Jamel Fleming recovered a fumble. Three sacks. Justin Houston had an interception. Nothing of note in either of the return games. Phillip Rivers, 19 of 30, 178 yards. Uh, no touchdowns, one interception. So he's obviously not throwing the ball much yesterday. I don't know what happened there, but we saw he was putting up some big-time numbers even though they were losing. Melvin Gordon continues to be unimpressive as the rookie running back. 15 of 37, 2.5 yards per carry. Overall, 25 for 52. That's not what they drafted this guy for. Stevie Johnson, 7 for 54. Dontrell Inman, 3 for 51. Javante Herndon, 5 for 37 in the receiving game. So we see that uh, Rivers was not able to get it to his big targets. That was reflected in his numbers. Javante Herndon fumbled and was lost. Three sacks, no interceptions. Nothing of note in the return game. Kansas City, we just discussed on a four-game winning streak right there in the wild card, as every other team is that's hovering around the 500 mark. We'll see how long they can keep it rolling. Certainly, Alex Smith's play has to be commended. It's been uh, very quiet this year, but he has been quite efficient. He's not turning the ball over, and he's playing very well. San Diego, do you sit Phillip Rivers down at this point? He's thrown the ball a ton this year, and you're not going anywhere. We'll have to see. There's you know a lot of talk about this team moving. That's something that uh, you just can't worry about if you're this team. You just got to keep playing and find a way to find the motivation to finish out this year. We'll see if they can do that. But uh, Kansas City really got to keep an eye on them quietly, quietly now at 5-5 five and, five and on a four-game win streak. <laughs> Excuse me. Next up, the Green Bay Packers beat the Minnesota Vikings 30-13. We told you that the Vikings were going to lose this game. Green Bay was not going to lose four straight. And it's surprising because Aaron Rodgers was not very good yesterday at all. 16 of 34, 212 yards, two touchdowns, no interception. Eddie Lacy looking to regain his game. 22 of 104.5 yards per rush. James Starks, 8 of 14. Overall, 34 of 124. Just 3.6 yards per rush. James Jones was the top receiver, 6 for 109. One touchdown. Devontae Adams, 3 for 36. Randall Cobb was 2 for 24 and had a touchdown. He had a lot of drops. Him and Aaron Rodgers are struggling to get on the same page. Sam Shields recovered a fumble. They had six sacks. Um, so they had Teddy Bridgewater uh, in their vice grips all game. Jeff Jennis, two returns for 83 yards. It's just 41.5 yards per return, which is very good. Mason Crosby made all five of his field goals. Teddy Bridgewater, 25 of 37, 296 yards, one touchdown, no interception. Adrian Peterson was held in check. 13 of 45, one touchdown. Teddy Bridgewater, 4 for 33, running the ball. Altogether, 18 of 94, 5.2 yards, and the touchdown by Adrian Peterson. Kyle Rudolph, the top receiver, the tight end, 6 for 106. Stephon Diggs, 6 for 66. Jarius Wright, 4 for 50. Kyle Rudolph had a touchdown, the only touchdown from Minnesota. Or no, excuse me, the only uh, receiving touchdown from Minnesota. Adrian Peterson lost a fumble, was at a critical time. Two sacks, no interceptions. Cordero Patterson returned the ball well. So for whatever reason, a lot of good returns in Minnesota, 
or no, actually, this is not surprising. Uh, it was last week that uh, it was surprising there weren't good returns. In the cold weather up there, you'd expect uh, kicks to be short um, and allows for returns. Cordell Patterson, 3 for 103, 34.3 yards per return. Zach Line, 2 for 38, 19 yards per return. But again, that means they also had five returns. So it means the team is scoring a lot. And nothing in the punt return game. So, Green Bay riding the ship just a bit. We'll see uh, if they can continue to keep this rolling. They will be playing the Bears on Thanksgiving. Minnesota drops to 7-3 and three for the Vikings. You know, as we discussed, they had been playing well. They just caught the Green Bay Packers at the wrong time. they got to put it behind them. And they've got to return a favor with a big win later in the year, uh, whoever it may be against. Um, obviously, Aaron Rodgers and Randall Cobb have got to get back on the same page. We'll see if they can do that. But from here... Uh, you got to be happy if you're a Packer fan that they were able to get this win and uh, get themselves right back in the division race. Next up, San Francisco lost to Seattle 29-13. Uh, San Francisco drops to 3-7. and seven. Seattle is now 5-5. Five and five. Blaine Gabbert, 22 of 34, 264, 264 yards, one touchdown, no interception. Sean Drone, 12 for 37. Blaine Gabbert, 4 for 22. Overall, 16 of 59. 3.7 yards per rush. Anquan Bolden, 5 for 93. Vance McDonald, 4 for 65. And a touchdown. Sean Drone and Bruce Ellington both fumbled. They were not lost. Only two sacks, no interceptions. Bruce Ellington, 4 returns for 96 yards, which is 24 yards per return. So pretty good there. Full Dawson made both his field goals. Russell Wilson, I think his best game of the season. 24 of 29, 260 yards, 3 touchdowns, no interceptions. Thomas Rawls went over 200 yards, 30 for 209, and a touchdown. Russell Wilson, 9 for 30, running the ball. Fred Jackson, 4 for 11, altogether 44 for 255, 5.8 yards per rush, and a touchdown. Doug Baldwin, the top receiver, 6 for 60. Tyler Lockett, 4 for 38. Thomas Rawls, 3 for 46. Lockett had 2 touchdowns. Thomas Rawls had 1. So... Uh, they didn't really throw the ball for a lot of yards. They didn't have to the way they were running. No fumbles. They had two sacks, no interceptions, no kick returns. So that's good because they were shutting down the 49ers and Hoshka made his field goal. San Francisco with Blaine Gabbert starting. A lot of talk about whether Colin Kaepernick's done or not. That'll be the result at the end of the year. Carlos Hyde and Reggie Bush are both gone. So they're going to really struggle to run the ball. San Francisco is going to have a hard time going the rest of the season. As for Seattle... Atlanta, again, keeping teams like Seattle in it. Um, Arizona won last night, so the division is still going to be very tough for them considering they've already lost to Arizona. They've got their sights set on a wild card. We'll see what they do the rest of the way. Uh, this could be a game that springboards them forward, and they start winning. Now would be the time for Seattle if they want to uh, piece together a couple wins here. And we'll see if Russell Wilson can guide them there. But uh, at 5-5, five and five, again, right in the thick of things in the NFC wild card. And then the Sunday night game, the Bengals lost their second in a row to the Cardinals, who won 34-31. Both teams are now 8-2. Andy Dalton, 22-39, 315 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Jeremy Hill, 13-45, 3.5 yards per rush, two touchdowns. Andy Dalton, 8-34. All together, 28-39, 3.5 yards per rush, two touchdowns. Giovanni Bernard, the running back, was the top receiver, 8 for 128. Uh, AJ Green four for seventy nine, which is pretty good. Not even for not for AJ Green standards. That is, he's usually better than that. He did have Patrick Peterson on him most of the night though. So uh, good matchup. Both guys played very well, as you can see by Green's numbers being where they were. Uh, Andy Dalton fumbled twice, lost one of them. Muhammad Sanu fumbled once; it was not lost. Two sacks. Reggie Nelson and Leon Hall had interceptions. Brandon Tate had a fifty eight yard kick return. And nothing else of note in the punt return game. Carson Palmer, 20 of 31, 317 yards, 10.2 yards uh, through the third pass, that is. Four touchdowns, two interceptions. Chris Johnson held in check, 18 of 63, only three and a half yards per rush. John Brown, two for nine, 4.5 yards per rush. Altogether, 25 of 82, 3.3 yards per rush. J.J. Nelson was the top receiver, 4 for 142, 35.5 yards per reception. That's very good. He had a 64-yarder and a touchdown. Larry Fitzgerald, 8 for 90. He was a possession receiver guy, made some big catches, especially on that last drive. 
John Brown, three for 43. Carson Palmer, Larry Fitzgerald, David Johnson, all fumbled. They were not lost. Deion Buchanan recovered a fumble. They had four sacks, no interceptions. Excuse me. David Johnson, three for 82, 27.3 yards per return. Patrick Peterson, three for 23 at 7.7 in the punt return. Chandler Cantazaro made both his field goals, including the game winner. Now, um, there was a call late in this game when Arizona was going to kick the game-winning field goal. Uh, they said that guy on Cincinnati was imitating the snap count. Had they not called it, it would have been a false start, and the clock would have ran out because it would have had the 10-second runoff. Now, the official is on top of that. Uh, they moved the umpire inside, uh, right behind the line of scrimmage. On the defensive side of the ball in the final two minutes, he, I mean, I'm going to assume he heard what he heard. Obviously, I was not field level, so we'll have to say that. I, you know, just hope, though, that he heard exactly what was being said and he didn't hear, you know, any other type of communication, maybe. Uh, it was uh, Domitop Pecco, I believe, got the penalty. I hope he didn't hear something where he was talking, you know, describing where he needed his defensive players to be or anything because that would be a horrible way to cost the team a game to call that but the uh, umpire was there so we're going to take him at his word that that was the correct call as for Cincinnati a lot's going to be made uh they struggle in prime time look they played a tough game on the road they come they came back from a 14 point deficit to tie it up, or excuse me from an 11 point deficit 10 point deficit uh to tie it up at 31 uh they just left too much time on the clock for Arizona who went right down the field Arizona uh, a game like this was big because had they lost, they would have only had a two-game lead over Seattle. I think they're pretty comfortable regardless, but certainly you want to just keep winning and don't let Seattle get any thought in their mind that they can uh, win this division, and you do that by stringing together a couple wins. There's only six games left, so they win a few more. Uh, you know, if they get two more wins, that means if Seattle loses one, uh, they can't finish with a worse record than the Seahawks, so... It's certainly right there and in front of them for the Cardinals. All right, so that's it for the breakdown of Week 11 Sunday games. We'll be back later today to give you a preview of tonight's game between the New England Patriots and the Buffalo Bills, so be sure to stay tuned for that in a little bit. Thank you so much.